I'm Joanne DeGenero, president of the Center for Excellence in Education, located in McLean, Virginia. I co-founded the center 37 years ago with the late Admiral H.G. Rickover, father of the nuclear-powered submarine and civilian uses of nuclear power. The center's mission has remained very focused to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to encourage STEM collaboration in the global community. The center's programs are unique. All are offered cost-free to invited students and teachers. Having no fee has leveled the playing field for many, many students. For the alumni of our programs, the center has helped them to realize their dreams of successfully pursuing scientific and technological careers. Over a hundred guests have registered for this public service event for them to receive cutting edge, up-to-date, relevant information about several medical specialties that affect or may affect each of them. Our panel is composed of outstanding alumni in medical specialties. These physicians attended the center's world-renowned Research Science Institute collaboratively sponsored with MIT and offered annually to 50 top achieving academic U.S. high school students. They are annually joined with 30 scholars from other nations. No U.S. student pays a fee to attend the six-week collaboratively program. However, international students must be financially sponsored by their nation or a corporation or organization, respectively. Our illustrious panel <clears throat> will be moderated by Dr. Shahom Roy. I take much pleasure in introducing Shahom to you. Shahom Roy is of the RSI class of 1986, and he was a counselor in 87. He is a, tendered, ten, a tenured professor at the University of Texas at Houston's Department of Head and Neck. I'm not going to try to say that name incorrectly, which I think is 14 letters. He is also with the Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital and serves as Assistant Dean of the University of Texas Houston Medical School. Dr. Roy received his undergraduate BS degree with highest distinction from Stanford University, received a full scholarship for medical education at Wash U in St. Louis, and completed his residency in head and neck surgery at the University of Miami. He completed his pediatric fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 2002, prior to joining the faculty at the University of Miami, where he was named Professor of the Year in 2003 and 2006. He was recruited to the chief position at the University of Texas Houston in 2009 and named Professor of the Year in 2013 and 2019. He will receive the prestigious Master's in Medical Management degree from Carnegie Mellon University in 2021. I am so proud of Dr. Roy, who is internationally renowned, renowned speaker and author, who has authored hundreds of scientific articles, book chapters, and research presentations. He is the international surgical expert in operating room fires and ran both the FDA and Joint Commission Committees on Prevention of Surgical Fires. In Shahom's spare time, 
He is an accomplished violinist, musician, and recording artist, and an avid athlete with two bad knees, who he says he could really use Jason Coe's help with the, that area. He credits the leadership at CEE, the students and alumni of RSI, and his colleagues on this panel for continually inspiring him to work harder, to be better, and to try to keep up with the incredible accomplishments of physicians, scientists, and educators. To my little Shahom that I think of as still 14, 15, and 16, the floor is yours, Shahom. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, the key here apparently is to write your own bio and it makes you sound really good. So thank you for the kind introduction. It is a huge honor for me to be here. Um, and to get to introduce this panel and to get to moderate this event. For me, it's personally very moving because the Center for Excellence in Education and the Research Science Institute, RSI, have made a tremendous impact in my life. And I hope that all of you watching here today are going to get a sense of how much of an impact that this program has had in each of our lives. You're gonna see two distinct themes over the course of today while we talk about advances in modern medicine. One is that all the folks who attend RSI tend to go on to incredible accomplishments in the scientific arena. They train at the best programs. They go to the highest rated institutions and they are all incredibly accomplished. The second theme that you will see is all of us after 30 something years are still scared of disappointing Mrs. D. So we are gonna do our best to absolutely make her proud of us because literally I promise you every one of us, they're all laughing right now because they know I'm telling the truth. Every one of us wants to make sure Mrs. D is not disappointed in us, even after all these years. So we're gonna try hard not to disappoint Mrs. D. So with that, I'm gonna start by introducing our first speaker today, and then we're gonna save uh, questions and comments for later on in the program when we all talk as a panel. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first panelist today. Our first panelist is Dr. Anthony Lombardo, who both has an MD and a PhD. Now, Anthony was in the very first RSI class, and then he served as a counselor and a senior member for subsequent cohorts, including mine in 1987. Anthony is a board-certified ophthalmologist who specializes in refractive surgeries, cataracts, and corneal surgeries. He completed his MD and his PhD at the University of Alabama School of Medicine. He did a one-year internship at the Mayo Clinic and then did his three-year ophthalmology training at the most prestigious ophthalmology program in the country at Wilmer Eye Institute, which is Johns Hopkins University. He then did an additional one-year fellowship in refractive surgery at Minnesota Eye Consultants. Anthony has one of the busiest ophthalmology practices in the entire Midwest, and he concentrates his clinical work on cataract surgery, laser vision correction, and complex anterior repair, including corneal transplants to help people see again. He also has instructed many, many other eye doctors in doing LASIK surgery and cataract surgery and has served as a clinical investigator for the FDA. He stays very active in the ophthalmology community by publishing, authoring chapters, and presenting at national meetings. Now, on a personal note, Anthony was my guidance counselor when I was about 15 years old, and he was a guy that all of us will tell you on this panel really looked up to, and we really just wanted to be more like Anthony because he was kind, he was mature, he was brilliant, and he was so charming, and none of that has changed today. So my RSI story is, I was coming out of a small town in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I was the only brown kid in a high school of 1,500 people. And being both brown and smart was not exactly a ticket to popularity in high school for me in those days. When I got to RSI for the first time, I was surrounded by an incredibly diverse group of people who all had one common theme, which was a brilliant mindset for science and technology. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged somewhere. And that theme has stayed with me my entire life. So without further ado, my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Anthony Lombardo. Uh, thank you very much, Helm. I, um, I want to thank you for that kind and unique introduction. I want to add my own um, RSI story before I begin, and that is I can remember um, when we were together and I was uh, a counselor and you were in session, I remember and you wanted to make a food run, I believe, and I remember loaning you my car and the car had, they were all these, uh, it was a 1970 Volkswagen, 
and it had all these idiosyncrasies to it just to get it started and running and you know, I tried to explain these idiosyncrasies to you and, and you said, yeah, 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 I don't think you're listening. And then you got down the road and the thing broke down and you just were a nervous wreck by the time you got back because it, I don't know, had to be towed or pushed or something. And uh, I remember how nervous you were about that whole thing. And you, it took you a day to get calmed down from that. But that was a 1970 vehicle. And um like Joan said, I was in the class of uh, 1984, and um, I just remember fondly like it was yesterday. Uh, I, I, remember, um, I remember the Admiral. Uh, I remember being with him and talking with him, and um, it, you know, it was just a, a presence to, to, to behold. And those sorts of memories just stick with me. So uh, after all these years, I thank you very much for that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and get started here, and I think, um, I think we can do this. Um, let me know if you can't see it or can't hear me, but um, when, when Ms. DiGennaro contacted me about doing this presentation, uh, I said, no, 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 I'm not your guy. I, you know, I'm a clinical ophthalmologist. I do clinical work, and, and well, I'm here now, so you can see who won that battle. Um, and, and what I'd like to talk about is cataract surgery. And what I'd like to do is highlight uh, some of the uh, technology uh, that I think uh, really makes cataract surgery uh, special. Um, there we go. Just so that we're all on the same page, I, I want to introduce you uh, or reacquaint you with the anatomy of the eye. A light comes in the front part of the eye, is focused by the cornea, is focused by the lens uh, to form a clear image on the retina. The retina transduces this light into an electrical signal, electrical signal sent to the brain for perception. And when you get a, a cataract, that lens gets cloudy. So it's a cloudy lens that fails to focus the light, scatters the light. So instead of focusing uh, light, you get cloudy vision. So normal vision is to pick the left. Vision with a cataract, cloudy vision on the right. People don't like this. They want that. They come see me for cataract surgery. Um, what I'd like to do is, is show you a video of cataract surgery. The video of the cataract surgery will form the template for uh, what I'll talk about as some of the advancements. The video picks up um, with a view from this direction, uh, from an AP direction. Uh, we've used a laser to enter the front part of the eye, the front part of the lens, and some of the lens has been softened by a laser, so it has a pattern to it. I will uh, narrate the video. Uh, so again, this is uh, looking down at the patient, the patient's eyelids held open. We um, anesthetize uh, the patient with a little bit of intravenous medicine, but they are breathing on their own here. The anterior segments entered and stabilized with a jelly to help provide space and hold open uh, the anterior chamber. The front capsule or the anterior portion of the cataract is removed. And then the substance of the cataract itself is mobilized. This cloudy lens is what we're twisting back and forth and it's what will be removed. I think one of the first things that you'll notice is that this lens that's gonna be removed probably measures 12, 13, 14 millimeters in diameter, about four millimeters in thickness. And all the surgery is being done through this tiny little incision. This incision here measures about two and a half three millimeters in width. And it's sort of that technology that allows us to take out this cataract of the larger dimensions through a smaller incision that I think represents the fundamental, a fundamental advancement in cataract surgery. Uh, these smaller incisions heal quicker, the smaller incisions are less prone to infection, the smaller incisions don't require a suture, the smaller incisions require return to mobility quicker. Uh, they distort the corneal architecture less. Uh, and so they give better vision, they give thinner glasses. There's everything better about this. 
but we require smaller instruments in order to do the surgery inside the eye. And it's this instrument here with this blue sleeve that just uh, moved out of the screen uh, that I think is probably the major advancement in cataract surgery that uses ultrasound, ultrasound energy to break up the cataract. Uh, there's a story that goes, this, uh, the inventor of this, Charles Kelman, was looking for ways to remove a cataract inside the eye and maintain this small incision. And uh, he was, went through a number of different iterations with inventions and equipment that just weren't working. He took a break from his Manhattan ophthalmology practice, went to have his teeth cleaned, and they used ultrasound to clean his teeth. As they're doing so, he stops for a moment and says, wait a second, what are you using here? And, and they tell him ultrasound, and he uses that as an idea to form the basis for modern fecal emulsification or modern ultrasound technology to remove a cataract. And that's how modern cataract surgery is done. Here you've just seen a lens implant go in position. This jelly that we removed earlier is being removed. So in essence, what we've done is taken out the cloudy cataract, this lens, and put in a clear uh, man-made implanted lens. So we've done it all under topical anesthesia. These small incisions have allowed us to do this surgery without, uh, without sutures, without uh, aggressive anesthesia. The anesthesia can be um, are just delivered as eye drops. So this, um, those, uh, it's a lightly edited video, but it doesn't take all that long to, to do cataract surgery. So the, 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 the point I want to make by watching the surgery is, is it's the phaco emulsification or the removal of the cataract with this instrumentation that has really um, been the major achievement. Um, the surgical goals of cataract surgery uh, vary from surgeon to patient. Uh, the surgeon wants safe surgery. The patient wants to see glasses free. A patient wants to see glasses free at all distances. The patients want to see glasses free at all distances under any lighting conditions. Many of my patients want to see glasses free at all distances under any lighting conditions and while reading any size font. And finally, they want safe surgery. So the difference between these two goals is is what has driven um, the innovation and the technology um, with cataract surgery. Uh, I'll tell you that there's about four, approaching four million cataract surgeries happening each year in the United States, probably 10 million internationally. So uh, the sort of medical economics and medical um, uh, this medical push-pull has sort of transferred the technology and the drive from private industry into trying to satisfy these goals here. So essentially these, these goals are for patient wants to see without glasses and they want to see as much as possible without glasses. Um, towards that end, things got rolling with uh, Alvar Goldstrand. Alvar Goldstrand was a um, Swedish ophthalmologist who did his work at the turn of the century. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for this eye modeling uh, that he uh, uh, constructed. The Nobel Prize was given in 1911. And, and essentially what he did was to try and model the eye as uh, two lenses. One is actually the cornea, which acts like the lens and the lens itself and come up with these dimensions, indices of refraction, and this model I, which, which essentially says there's, there's two lenses and there's a point at which these, this lens system uh, needs to focus the light. And this really just becomes an optics problem at this point, right? I mean, you have two lenses and a distance. Um, it's almost that simple, it, nothing ever is. Um, the model has become uh, increasingly complex with time. Each of these interfaces has an index of refraction change that needs to be accounted for. Both surfaces of the cornea, uh, the anterior chamber, both surfaces of lens, the vitreous, all this needs to be accounted for. Even within the lens itself, 
uh, there's changing uh, of refraction, uh, indices of refraction needs to be accounted for. The anterior surface, need, uh, this surface needs to be measured with a, 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 a precision. And then even this axial length needs to be very, very precisely measured. So you know, when we take a cataract out, what strength lens we need for this system in order to focus light precisely on this point. So over the course of the past uh, 100 years, um, a lot of advancements have been made. We currently use something called partial coherence laser interferometry to measure this axial length, the distance from here to here, in a very, very precise manner to uh, about 10 microns, uh, allowing us to you know, make a very precise estimate as to the lens implant to be placed if it were only that easy, right? I mean, when a lens implant is put in place, there's a healing effect. This lens implant doesn't always end up where you put it. There's some uh, play here as to how the lens heals, and, and that generates some, some refractive error. But if we can get the lens close enough, that's what counts. That's what allows our patients using these models in order to see well in the distance. Bear in mind, seeing well at one distance is part of what patients want. What patients also want is to see well at all distances. The way vision at various distances is achieved in the eye that hasn't had cataract surgery, turns out this lens is flexible. And so this flexible lens is acted on through muscles located right here, through these zonules that cause the lens to change shape. And so the shape change to the lens changes its strength and therefore changes the focal point of this whole system, allowing us to see well in the distance or well up close. Unfortunately, when we take a cataract out, put a new lens implant in place, it can't change shape. That lens that you saw go in place with that surgical video doesn't change shape. So uh, the technologies, uh, the, the Problem at hand is how do we get patients to see <clears throat> at multiple distances with cataract surgery? And the obvious answer is to try and replicate nature and, and to develop a system where this lens can change shape. Uh, the first attempt at doing this involved putting polymers in place, sort of opening a, only a very small portion of this, not that larger incision you saw me make, but just a small portion of the lens filling this lens capsule, not with that rigid lens, but with a polymer that then gels to something about the consistency of a gummy bear, so that when it's acted on by these zonules attached to these muscles can change shape and give this accommodation, this ability to see in the distance and up close. It doesn't work very well. There's some issues with uh, the polymerization and the hardening and it's uh, being inert enough to uh, satisfy their requirements. Uh, another solution involves actually a lens that moves, right? So uh, imagine if, if you implanted a lens that was hinged in some way. So these are the hinges to this lens system. Here's our musculature acting on this, on the zonules that then pull on this lens and cause it to flex at, at the hinge and move back and forth. So a lens that moves back and forth, a lens of a fixed power that can move back and forth can achieve that uh, ability to see well in the distance and well up close. That too was a good idea that worked marginally well. Turns out that when placed in the eye, this lens doesn't flex quite as well as it does in the JPEG that's running here, but uh, it can sometimes take on Z configurations or can flex, but then not flex back. Uh, these muscles don't act in a way that, that can positively move the lens in, in, a, in enough fashion to give you good vision at both distance and near. The, the system is just simply too unpredictable. Another solution might be to put a different type of lens system in place. This lens system here is actually two lenses. There is a positive or a, a concave lens, a convex lens here and a concave lens here, a positive lens and a negative lens. They're held together at this hinge here and this hinge here. And a positive lens and a negative lens uh, essentially represents a Galilean telescope, right? So this 
can magnify images depending on the distance between this positive lens and the distance between this negative lens, you get a different focal point. It's like focusing your telescope. So the idea is this all this hardware, this lens system here, gets crammed in this tiny little bag right here. And so that when this musculature acts on the solary body and on the uh, zonules, it moves these lenses closer together and further apart. The lenses move further apart. You focus your Galilean telescope for up close. The lenses get moved close together. You focus your Galilean telescope inside your lens, inside your eye to something further apart. Well, that's a lot of hardware to put in the eye. So uh, that, that was the real problem there. Um, I'm sure there are material scientists and engineers and uh, mechanical engineers on this call. Uh, this system was designed um, by optical engineers, uh, but then they actually turned, my understanding is they turned, the company turned to uh, Mattel, uh, the toy manufacturer, uh, when they were at their height of transformers and asked them, how can we get all this hardware through that small incision that you saw? So uh, this, uh, they were able to do it through a slightly larger incision, uh, but we really didn't get the kind of kind of accommodation that we wanted and the ability to tell our patients to see near and distance out of this system. Turns out that the answer and the most common way that we get patients to see distance and near is through the process of diffraction. And, and just so that we're all on the same page, uh, the process of refraction or refraction is, is a change in the angle of light or the bending of light when it hits an incident surface at anything other than 90 degrees. And that's how glasses work, and that's how contact lenses work, and that's how most optics in a traditional, say, a magnifying glasses work. What diffractive optics do is, is use uh, edges to bend light. So it, it really bends light by using the edges of surfaces, edges of different heights, different spacing, uh, different patterns, uh, then can bend light to create multifocality. So uh, these lenses that are implanted are implanted with a grid work of um, dif a diffractive grid work that bends the light. And, and optical engineers now have this at their disposal to create near focuses and distance focuses. The light that enters this lens, and if it's depicted here and into this dust chamber, uh, is now tuned to form a far focus and a near a near focus and a far focus. Um, so this is how modern day um, multifocal lenses work. So patients get lenses allow them to see distance and near based on this technology. So this is a technology that currently leads the way. It turns out one. One last thing patients want, patients don't want to see well at distance and near, they want to see well at distance and near and at their computer, at their laptop, everything in between. So they just take the problem one step further. And so they can engineer these lenses with very complex patterns of diffractive grid work, all in this annular design that in profile get quite complex and renders renders focal points at infinity, which is useful for distance like driving a television, which renders a focal point at 60 centimeters, which turns out to be ideal for uh, working at the computer, and then something at 40 centimeters, which works uh, well up close. Um, lenses are not without problems. There's a, some scatter of light uh, that goes on, and, and so Really, the problem at hand and the one that's currently being worked on with the latest iterations of these lenses include trying to avoid scattering of light or rings around rings or halos around point sources of light. By manipulating these diffractive patterns on these lenses, we're able to try to minimize these things and give patients the broader range of vision with minimal side effects. There's a lot that goes on in ophthalmology. I know that um, Shahom was going to give us all a chance to talk about um, medicine and our careers, but um, I really find that what I enjoy most about this career of ophthalmology is being able to get all this new technology and, and get it 
quickly in the patients, and not only to get it quickly in the patients, but see the fruits of my labor quickly. So, um, you know, it's not, not weeks or months, but only days or sometimes hours after surgery that, that patients start to realize the benefits of the surgery that they had. So that's, that's what's most appealing to me about this. This concludes what I have to say about this, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions either, either at the end or in between. Anthony, thanks so much. Um, we do have a couple questions. I'm going to save them for a little bit later so we can do them all as a group discussion yeah. because I think there's stuff that we could all learn from that. Um, thank you for that interesting uh, talk. That was uh, really cool to see. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presentation, and this one is uh, this is a big deal for me because I get to introduce my dear friend, Fred Chen. Fred and I were the same class at RSI in 1986. Fred has been a huge supporter of CEE uh, for all those years, and I think served on the board of directors for, for some period of time. I mean, he's had a huge role in CEE over the years. Now, uh, Fred got his undergrad degree and his MD and his PhD from Harvard University. I told you RSI tends to breed people who go to the best places. And then apparently one of the things they didn't teach you during your three different degrees from Harvard was how to actually leave Boston because he never found the highway exit and he has been in Boston ever since. He did his uh, general surgery residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, did his thoracic surgery fellowship at MGH, and then went back to Brigham and Women's for his first uh, faculty position. In 2015, he became the chief of cardiac surgery at Tufts. Fred Chen is the true triple threat in medicine. This is an incredible clinician who does the complete spectrum of cardiac surgery. He's a heavily published academic surgeon who has both R01 grant funding from the NIH and American Heart Association funding. He supervises a lab that has international recognizance for his research. He's educated hundreds of postdoctoral fellows and trained hundreds of cardiac surgeons. There's a nickname that people don't know, and Fred, I gotta just call you out on this. They call it the Chen School. This is the nickname if you train with Dr. Chen you go to the Chen School because you become a true serious academic surgeon. He has won multiple awards. He's held numerous leadership positions. And here's what I want to tell you on a personal note. Fred and I grew up together. We've known each other since we were 15 years old. Fred is my hero and my chase rabbit all at once because anything I try to do in my career, Dr. Chen has already done it and he's done it better than everybody else. When we were medical students, getting ready to interview for residency. I was out in Boston and I stayed with him for a night. Fred, I don't know if you remember this, but as a medical student, he had some surgical instruments and he was whipping them around in his hand like he was a 10 year veteran experienced surgeon. And he said, I'm practicing because I want to be good when I get to residency. I was a fourth year med student. I didn't have a clue how to operate. And Fred was already doing stuff 10 years ahead of the rest of us. And I remember thinking of that moment, I got to be more like him. I got to start thinking ahead. This is the true triple fat academic surgeon. It is a huge honor to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Frederick Chen. Thank you for that um, hyperbole. And I want to assure the audience that they're all lies. They're all complete and utter lies. But that being said, you know, as you know, Shahom, it is a real pleasure and honor uh, to be here, to have you introduce me, to be here at um, this very uh, incredibly important uh, medical event. And before I get started, let me just put my timer on so I do not go over. Um, you know, as Shahom uh, was saying, I, I was a classmate with him at RSI in 1986. And I uh, did, did get a couple of letters um, from Fair Harvard. I did train at uh, Fair Harvard hospitals. And not to knock them at all, but I would have to say in all my years, the Center for Excellence in Education and the Research Science Institute remains really the most important educational institution in my life. It really is a, another family. My RSI roommate um, was in my wedding. I was his best man. And so it remains to this day, not to take anything away from Fair Harvard, uh, the most important educational institution in my life. And for those of you who are attending now, uh, I think that, um, congratulations, uh, you are in a very, very special program. Now, cardiac surgery, uh, cardiac surgery is um, surgery of the heart, 
uh, correcting abnormal issues with heart valves, anatomy, heart arteries, uh, the pumping chamber, as well as surgery of the great vessels, the aorta and main arterial branches off of the aorta. Here's a picture of the heart and it's pretty realistic. That's kind of what it looks like. It's a little more red and a little more yellow, but that's essentially what it looks like. These are the great vessels. Uh, this is the fat and there are some heart arteries. And what, is, what's, what are the distinguishing factors about cardiac surgery? Well, I like to think that anything that makes surgery surgery is accentuated in cardiac surgery. It is an intense specialty. I find it extremely difficult. I'm not gonna make any bones about it. Sometimes I'm in the operating room and I'm trying to do this procedure and I'll look at myself and I'll think, you know, I, I, I cannot believe I'm doing this. Acuity, life and death, highly pressurized situations, whatever you think and imagine about cardiac surgery, it's essentially kind of true. Long and arduous training period, one does things that few people can do. Really, unrelenting demands on your intelligence, your emotion, hand-eye skill, and believe it or not, physical fit and stamina. If any of you have seen the uh, movie Hunt for Red October and Captain Ramey is, is trying to avoid the missile and he's talking to sonar, con, um, weapons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's essentially what it's like being a cardiac surgeon in the operating room. You're controlling various different things all in the same uh, parallel time and you are the person who's doing it all. It's really like a ballet or a symphonic performance at its best. Of course, at its worst, it's kind of like a disorganized battlefield. You know, when I say emotion, I really mean it. Patients do die on you routinely. And the mortality for these uh, procedures is probably something like one to, you know, anywhere high risk procedure, 25%. So unfortunately, patients do die on you. But at the other hand, it is extremely rewarding because you literally save somebody's person's life acutely. They can be dying in the emergency room you save them, and you literally bring them back to life. And that's very special. A typical operation, four to 12 hours, a complex sequence of events, divide the breastbone, access the heart, connect the person to the heart-lung machine, stop the heart from beating, you arrest the heart, so to speak, repair the heart, restart the heart, wean the person of the heart-lung machine, and repair everything that has been disturbed in the meantime. Now, what are the current trends? There's a trend toward minimally invasive surgery, as Anthony was saying, and that holds true for cardiac surgery as well. There are catheter treatments for valvular and aortic diseases. The future trend actually is one of a severe shortage of heart surgeons and one of increasingly um, surgery for heart failure where the heart does not work well. The most common disease that we've all heard about, coronary artery, coronary artery disease, heart artery blockages. You know, the muscle is fed by arteries. They can be blocked up by so-called plaques consisting of cholesterol, fat, calcium. If big enough, those plaques can prevent the heart muscle from receiving enough blood, and they can put a person at risk for heart attack, heart failure, and mortality. Three different treatments, medicine, stenting, which is a percutaneous intervention. It's essentially like you're treating a block pipe with the rotor root approach. And then cardiac surgery, which is bypass surgery, the operation you've all heard about. Essentially bypass surgery is creating a parallel circuit to the heart artery blockage. It renders that blockage functionally irrelevant. And one uses vein or other arteries within the body to create that parallel circuit. The increasing trend toward in cabbage surgery, and this is the bypass surgery you all hear about, is for the conduits that are used to be arterial. You know, uh, they live alongside the chest wall, internal mammary arteries, and so an increasing trend is to use both in the field. Now this actually makes the heart operation even harder and longer, and why do this? Well, the data clearly show that using both mammary arteries increases the benefit of bypass surgery. The benefit of bypass surgery is actually one of both quality of life symptoms, but equally as important 
survival, meaning coronary artery bypass grafting restores a person's survival to his near normal better than any other therapy that we have. And using both mammary arteries gives even better results. And this is just a schematic of that. This is the left internal thoracic artery alongside the chest wall I was talking about. This is the right. And this shows that they are being connected to two arteries of the heart. Now, when Bill Clinton had his procedure, what kind of operation did he have? He had both mammary arteries in an on-pump operation. Now, what about catheter valve treatment? The aortic valve is the main valve from the heart to the body. Uh, and as part of the natural aging process, that valve can become thickened and stiff. What that does typically is prevent the valve from opening well. And when it doesn't open well, the heart's doing an enormous amount of work trying to pump blood against a hole which is very small. When the process is severe, this results in decreased survival and poor quality of life. Traditional surgery, as we discussed, the breastbone is divided. Person is placed on the heart-lung machine. The heart stopped. The native valve is removed and a prosthesis is placed. This is kind of what it looks like in the operating room. The aorta has been divided. The old valve has been excised and the prosthetic valve is implanted. What about transcatheter valve approach? Well, this is a way to treat this condition by using a catheter-based approach. Instead of removing the own native heart valve, it's just simply left in place. And with the catheter placed through the aorta and through the valve, a new valve is implanted within the old valve. And believe it or not, this has been shown to have pretty good results in medium to high risk patients. What is medium to high risk in cardiac surgery? About four to five, excuse me, four to 50% mortality. Cardiac surgery operations are the most studied operations in the history of medicine. And so for any single procedure, there's a huge database that has been kept um, by the society. So we can calculate pretty much very accurately what the risk is for renal failure, mortality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see if a surgeon takes care of medium risk patients and the typical cardiac surgeon does, let's say if you're very busy, you do take care of 200 patients, you'll probably have something like four to eight patients die on you every year. Now this kind of calculates out that way, but one can see how patients typically can pass away on you, unfortunately. At the same time, you're saving hundreds. This is a schematic of the transcatheter valve. And again, the new valve is brought through the old valve. It's blown up and the old valve, the old native valve is mushed up against the sides. Now, another, um, uh, another area where catheters are starting to make an advance, thoracic aortic aneurysms. Aneurysms of the aorta are essentially enlargements of the natural aorta. And if enlarged, then that poses a risk of rupture. Traditionally, the treatment has been very invasive surgery. This is schematic of the aorta. And these are aneurysms that are all along the aorta. And traditional surgery occurs when you have a patient who literally is cut in half and then this enlarged aorta is replaced. This is an actual picture from such a procedure. And so one trend to catheter-based is to use a catheter-based approach where a stent is placed within the aneurysm and blown up. Now I've presented ways in which surgery has actually been kind of replaced by catheters. And does this mean cardiac surgery is dying? Far, far from it. In fact, the demand is constantly increasing. The projections are that cardiac surgery will be in severe shortage. As a population gets older, transplantation, heart failure surgery, it all comes into play. Coronary artery surgery remains very strong. Cardiac transplantation, there's currently a new way of preserving donor hearts to increase the number of cardiac transplantations. Cardiac transplantation, of course, you remove the old, you know, sick heart that's too sick to sustain life, and you replace it with uh, one uh, which is uh, well-preserved and functioning through some sort of tragic donor accident. Good that comes out of a tragedy. 
one current trend is to increase uh, the donor pool by different techniques of preserving these donor hearts. COVID. Now, COVID is really primarily a disease of inflammation of the lungs gone amok. The heart-lung machine is a known risk factor for lung inflammation. So how does COVID play into cardiac surgery? We think, and the sparse data show, that if you have a COVID-positive patient, that the risk of cardiac surgery is very high and probably prohibitive because the lungs will then receive a double hit uh, whammy, the risk of COVID plus the inflammation from the heart-lung machine. And that's currently being sorted out now. Again, I'd like to end a personal note of deep and personal gratitude, deep and heartfelt to my family from the Center for Excellent Education, Shahom Jason, spent a summer with Jason, I can't believe that, where we discussed things I won't even mention here. But in any case, for all the um, uh, people who are contemplating medicine, be happy to talk to you about a career in academic medicine, cardiac surgery, there's my email. Please feel free to reach out, call the center, be more than happy to discuss whatever you want to talk about. Thank you. Fred, thanks so much. That was fascinating. And we have a lot of questions uh, that we're going to want to discuss in our group chat. Uh, for now, let me turn it over now to Dr. Amy Crago. And it is a huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Crago. Uh, Dr. Crago earned her PhD at the University of Cambridge as a Marshall Scholar and then got her, MIT, or her MD in the combined Harvard-MIT Health Sciences and Technology Division. She then did her general surgery training at Georgetown and her surgical oncology for cancer surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the top cancer hospitals in the world. She joined the Memorial Sloan Kettering faculty in 2010 and has served on both the gastric and mis mixed tumor services in addition to sarcoma disease management. And she is an active active surgeon who deals with all types of soft tissue sarcomas and coordinates both a traditional sort of translational science research program that focuses on molecular drivers of sarcoma tumors and how genomic aberrations in these tumors can actually adjust patient care. And I think that's what she's going to get into a little bit today. Now, she has been funded by the National Cancer Institute, the FDA, the American College of Surgeons, the American Cancer Society. She has an incredibly well-funded internationally renowned lab, and she's also a committed educator who teaches others about sarcoma biology. Um, she has held numerous awards and numerous faculty positions, in addition to chairing a number of leadership positions on multiple organizations. She was a student at RSI in 1990, but stuck around the RSI enterprise because she served as a counselor, a teaching assistant, and the assistant director of the program all the way through the 90s. On a personal note, the first time I saw Dr. Crago give a talk was about 15 years ago at a conference. And I, I will never forget this, Amy. I turned to the person sitting next to me and I just looked at her and I said, who is that? Because she blew the audience out of the water with the caliber of the work that she's doing. So we're looking forward to her talking about the advances in sarcoma biology and what surgical oncologists, cancer surgeons are doing these days. Amy, take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, um, and like all of these guys, really do have to credit RSI with a significant amount of, um, uh, you know, with a significant contribution to my uh, development as a, as a scientist and as a surgeon scientist. I, I came from a school where we had really almost no AP courses and uh, where we were taking home ec while the guys at the guy's school were taking BC calculus. So, so to come uh, to RSI and really be a part of that research experience was, was very important for me. Like it was mentioned, I'm going to talk today about a genomic characterization of soft tissue sarcomas and just try and sort of uh, talk, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about how, as we understand more about cancers, it's affecting on, on the genomic level, it affects how we really diagnose patients and treat them and stratify them uh, to tell them a little bit more about what their prognosis will be. So I'd be surprised if, if many of the younger uh, attendees actually knew what sarcomas were. They're very rare cancers. They really account for only about 1% of all the malignancies in the country. There are only about 12,000 cases uh, diagnosed in the U.S. each year. And 
And while about 30 years ago, everybody treated one sarcoma like another sarcoma, we now understand that even amongst those 12,000 cases, there are actually over 100 different subtypes of disease. And so each one has different uh, biologic behavior, each one uh, has different outcomes for patients, and each one can be targeted for treatment very differently. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how those genomic variations have allowed us to develop new diagnostic tools, prognostic markers, and how in their lab we're trying to understand how the genomic events that drive tumor genesis uh, can be targeted for, for treatment strategies. So just to give you a little idea, these are outcomes in about eight different subtypes of sarcoma. And we're lucky here at Memorial because we have a database that looks at how patients do after surgery that was started over now 30 years ago. And so there are over 10,000 patients in that cohort. And, and, and so we've been able to learn quite a lot about them. And we also now have over 6,000 patients with tumors uh, that have been banked in our biobanks so that we can study those on the genomic level. So here you can see this uh, uh, looks at disease specific survival as a proportion of patients who are alive after a certain number of years. And so patients with malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, so tumors that develop uh, from the, um, the Schwann cells uh, around the tumors or, or some of the um, other uh, covering of the nerves, uh, those patients uh, have quite a high risk of uh, recurrence and death from disease after, after surgical resection, whereas there are other patients, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about this type of tumor, desmoid tumors, uh, these patients almost never die of their disease. So being able to follow these patients after surgery it's really uh, provided us with a significant amount of information. And then the databases, like I, uh, and then the, um, the databases uh, in conjunction with genomic studies on our tissue banks have really allowed us to understand what is driving each of those tumors. So, for example, uh, there are tumors that come from the fat that are associated with gene amplifications in oncogenes like MDM2 and CDK4. Whereas the desmoid tumors I talked to you about have activating mutations in, in beta catenin. So, so you can imagine that because of these differences in genetics, the cells look different, the uh, outcomes may be different, and, and how we can treat these tumors may be very different. So uh, this is just one example of how we identified uh, genomic uh, events that drive different subsets of tumors. So, there's one type of tumor called solitary fibrous tumors. These often occur in the meninges, in the pleural, uh, along the pleural lining and along the peritoneal lining. And uh, with the advent of RNA-seq, where we can look at what the transcriptome in a tumor uh, uh, looks like, what we found was that there is a translocation associated with the genes NAB2 and STAT6. And both of these genes are on chromosome 12. We don't understand why it happens, but the front part of NAB2 uh, is sliced, the back part of STAT6, which causes activation of STAT6 and its nuclear translocation. This can happen at different points uh, between the two genes, but in general, it, it, um, it causes a translocation of this oncogene to the nucleus where it acts as a transcription marker. And clinically, that's been important. We don't yet know how to, to inhibit this event, but we can use it to confirm that a patient has a solitary fibrous tumor. Because most of the sarcomas look like this. It's a little hard to see. These are, are small, but they have these long spindly type cells. But with the SFTs in particular, the nucleus of the cells stain very uh, avidly if you use antibodies and immunohistochemical stains that are designed to identify STAT6. So our pathologist, if they're looking at a spindle cell tumor, can use STAT6 to confirm that, that this is a solitary fibrous tumor, which tells us how, can help us to tell the patient how their tumor is likely to behave. Another type of sarcoma that we uh, study, liposarcoma, as I mentioned these a few min a minute ago, well, and D-differentiated liposarcoma is the most common. There are actually five types of tumors that can develop from the fat. These, the well-differentiated tumors are low grade, they grow slowly, and the D-differentiated tumors, they recur, uh, they tend to be the types that recur more rapidly and have metastatic potential. 
these tumors, the operations we do for them are very different than what Anthony does for the cataract surgery. You can see if he uses two millimeter incisions, we use incisions that can be almost two feet long because these tumors can grow so large. They're almost all associated with amplifications on 12Q, 23 to 25, which encodes the MDM2 and, uh, uh, and uh, CDK4 amplicons. But you can see uh, this in the D-differentiated tumors, they're actually much more chromosomally complex. So these charts look chromosome by chromosome at whether, to, uh, whether genes are, whether there are too many copies of genes, so an amplification, or too few copies, whether the, the genes have been lost, and these are deletions. So you can see both types of tumors, the slow growing type and the rapidly growing type, have amplifications at 12Q. But the D-differentiated tumors also have these other recurrent uh, uh, deletions. Uh, so for example, 11Q deletions happen in 30% of D-differentiated tumors. And if we look at patients and how they do, those patients who have this loss on 11Q or 19Q, they actually do much worse than patients who have no 19Q loss. So you can see almost all of these patients who underwent surgical resection recurred really quite quick, quickly after before two years. So when we think about that in terms of treatment of cancer, patients who do badly after surgery, those are actually patients where we want, in addition to surgical intervention, to use things like chemotherapy or radiation to try and prevent these recurrences. Whereas a patient who did much better, maybe those, those adjuvant therapies are less beneficial. Um, and so uh, the last sort of little scenario I want to talk about uh, is a, a little bit about how understanding these genomic uh, events is really driving what we do in the lab. So one of our, our major NIH, our most recent our NIH grant uh, look is, is, is studying these tumors called desmoid tumors. And they are tumors, like I mentioned, that are uniformly associated with mutations in beta catenin. But they can behave very differently in one patient versus another, and we don't really understand why. You can tell the biology of this tumor, and this is a, a picture of a patient cut um, from front to back. So this is the spine, and this is the abdominal wall. You can tell that the biology of this tumor is clearly very different than this tumor, but they're both desmoids. And the tumors that look bright on these MRI sequences, <coughs> they tend to grow quickly, whereas those that are, are darker, these tend to have more collagen and they don't seem to grow over time. So a patient with this type of tumor where it doesn't even grow if you watch it, the desmoids have no metastatic potential. A lot of times we don't have to do anything for them, whereas a patient like this, we really have to understand what beta catenin is doing and what other signals are important in order to know how to treat them. So we know uh, from a clinical trial, just by accident, somebody gave an anti-angiogenic drug, serafinib, to these patients, and a phase three, and the, uh, the patient responded. Uh, they did a phase three trial looking at serafinib compared to placebo, and you can see that in patients with serafinib, their disease generally stopped growing, whereas in patients in, with who got just the sugar pill, their disease continued uh, to grow over time. And this is. Uh, Progression, what we call progression-free survival charted uh, uh, against months. And you can see this is just the, how the, the tumors changed on imaging uh, after treatment with serafinib. You can see most tumors got smaller. So the question uh, we're looking at in the lab is why beta-catenin would affect serafinib uh, would, in, would, in, would make the tumor sensitive to serafinib. And so this is just a, a schematic of what went signaling and beta catenin signaling looks like in a cell. Uh, there are receptors on the plasma membrane that uh, are inactive in the absence of Wnt ligands, which are the, the external signals. And in that context, there's a molecule called APC, which causes de phosphorylation and degradation of beta catenin. When Wnt binds, APC and, and its binding partner acts and go to the membrane, and so beta-catenin doesn't get phosphorylated, and instead it goes to the nucleus where it uh, induces transcription of oncogenic genes. And so in the desmoids, these phosphorylation sites are mutated, or in rare cases, APC is lost so that the protein isn't broken down and it constitutively goes into the nucleus. So 
So one of my postdocs has been looking at what this, what happens in the cells when beta catenin is activated and by knocking out beta catenin expression, she can see that there also uh, induces a decrease in HIF1 alpha signaling. And HIF1 alpha we know is one of the ma master regulators of angiogenesis or, or the development of blood vessels and tumors. Uh, so she can see that that also causes decrease in transcription of HIF1 target genes. And if we look in tumors at the RNA profiles of desmoids compared to normal uh, mesenchymal cells, then we can see that HIF1 genes really, uh, if you cluster the tumors based on expression of HIF1 genes, the desmoid tumors are definitely expressing HIF1 targets differently than normal cells. So she also, uh, when she looked at whether or not the desmoids can induce, since HIF1 we know is important for angiogenesis, she grew the desmoid cells in vitro with endothelial cells, so the cells that line uh, blood vessels. And she can see that the desmoids cause the endothelial cells to form these tubes. But if you knock out beta catenin, that doesn't seem to ha happen as effectively. You can get little clusters, but they don't really form complete rings. Uh, and the same thing is true if you knock out HIF1 alpha, you just don't get the same sort of efficient uh, endothelial cell tube formation. And this is just shown in that in graphic form formation. So that supported the, fat, the, the hypothesis that beta catenin can, can affect angiogenesis. Um, and since serafinib uh, can also affect angiogenesis, we thought maybe this was how it was behaving. And uh, indeed, if we uh, look at how serafinib affects uh, tumor cells themselves, it takes really quite high doses of serafinib to, um, to prevent desmoid cells from growing, which doesn't go along with what was seen in the trial. Instead, what you can see is if you give serafinib to the cells, though, at much lower concentrations, so one micromolar compared to 20 or 30, you can inhibit this tube formation. So we think maybe that's actually how the drug is working, not just affecting the desmoid cells themselves, but the endothelial tube, the endothelial and the blood vessel formation that cells require in order to gain nutrients and oxygen in the tumor to, to grow. And we can see that serafinib inhibits HIF1 alpha in the desmoid cells, and that and that this whole process seems linked to expression of phosphorylated VEGFR2 which is a common uh, signaling molecule in endothelial cells that um, causes their tube formation. So, um, so really, uh, all of this data together, uh, we think, suggests that beta-catenin is working through HIF1-alpha in part to cause the tumors to grow uh, via uh, inducing new blood vessels that can bring more nutrients to the tumor cells, and that serafinib actually may prevent desmoid tumor cell growth by by inhibiting these processes. We also wanted uh, just uh, to see whether the serafinib can affect the desmoid cells themselves. Like I said, I don't think it affects how they grow, but we can see that it inhibits activation of a receptor on the desmoid cells called PDGF, uh, PDGFR beta. And, and its ligand, PDGF, if we give that to cells, we can see that it increases HIF1-alpha um, and in vitro, we can see that if you give PDGFBB with desmoid cells and endothelial cells, you get much more tube formation than even if you gave endothelial cells PDGFB alone. So, so to us, that suggested that the, the ligand and the receptor are also acting on the tumor cells themselves, that we can see it, um, it, it, it even ramp up this HIF1-alpha, cooperate with beta-catenin to ramp up this HIF1-alpha uh, process and so uh, that provides us another potential pathway that serafinib is acting through. So PDGF works with beta-catenin to cause HIF1 overexpression, which then causes secretion of proteins, which activate VEGFR and cause these endothelial tubes to form. So, so this whole pathway, we sort of are, are based on our knowledge that we've gained from genomic studies showing beta-catenin is active in these tumors and just chance knowledge that this drug worked. And so, so those two pieces of information together are really giving us information on how, how, how genetic uh, abnormalities are working in the desmoid cells to uh, cause 
cause different types of cancer. So, so just in conclusion, uh, genomic analysis of soft tissue tumors helps us identify drivers that we can use as diagnostic markers, like in STAT6 and the SFTs. High-risk tumors can be identified as well, increasing genomic complexity, right, she predicts recurrence in liposarcoma. And by identifying these oncologic drivers, we can also sort of map out new uh, targetable theories, therapies or try and uh, new drugs for cancer or, or try to understand how current drugs are, are working. So there's a whole group of people who help us with this and I think it's always important to uh, recognize them, particularly Gia, my postdoc who helps and, and all our funding uh, sources as well. So again, thank you for having me and, and to RSI for, uh, for all its support over the years. Amy, that was terrific. Thank you. Folks, if you ever felt like you needed to understand what the term physician scientist meant, that's it right there. That's the definition of physician scientist. And Amy is one of those people that I think we all just admire for all of her incredible accomplishments. That was absolutely brilliant. And to be honest, I, some of that was totally over my head, so I'll look forward to the discussion. Um, let's move on to our anchor presentation. And this is a big one for me because Jason Coe, was in the second class of RSI and then was a counselor for Fred and I in 1986 and has remained extremely active in the CEE organization. Now, Jason also is the first of his family to attend RSI, but two of his siblings also attended RSI, which has got to be some kind of a first to have had three members of the same family, Mrs. D, attend RSI. Jason's an internationally renowned orthopedic surgeon. He has again contributed significantly clinically on the research front with administration and entrepreneurship. He's a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard, got his MD from Johns Hopkins, did his internship at MGH, Mass General, did his residency at the esteemed Hospital for Special Surgery that just does orthopedics, and then his fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, and somewhere along the way decided to get his MBA at Northwestern with some additional coursework at Harvard Business School. He now chairs the largest department of orthopedic surgery in the entire Chicago area. He and I were chatting last night. He's got 35 full-time orthopedic surgeons under his department that he is responsible for hurting and guiding in the right direction. He's the founder of the North Shore Orthopedic Institute and has established a tremendous multidisciplinary program in arthritis, sports medicine, and spine care. He's been the team doctor for the Chicago Fire soccer team, the Joffrey Ballet, and the Chicago Cubs and helped them win the World Series. He's won numerous awards, has received NIH funding. Uh, he's published more than 100 cha uh, book chapters and papers. He's worked with medical device companies and technology companies to help translate from the bench top to successful clinical trials and commercialization. He is a true academic powerhouse. And most of all, Fred and I will tell you that Jason was a guy when we were very vulnerable teenagers going through some hormonal years and some, some difficult upbringing, Jason was a guiding light. He was a beacon of light in the darkness for us and really guided us when we needed somebody to just show us the ropes, somebody to inspire us, but also to keep us out of trouble and to point us in the right direction. Jason's been a lifelong friend. It's an honor to turn it over to him. Jason, please. Uh, Shahom, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really a, a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, it... Um, you know, for me, RSI was actually really uh, foundational, I think, as it was for many of us. And uh, I see that there's a lot of people on the call and on the um, screen here. The, um, you know, obviously it's a place where uh, you can make incredible friendships, uh, a place where you could feel at home. Um, and, you know, in many, you know, and I would say that it absolutely put me on a career of academic medicine engaged in research and uh, really inspired me to continue to be academically active uh, and inquiring. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my friendships with uh, uh, you, Fred, Anthony, everybody here and uh, has been, have been very important for me. I think that's been something that's uh, sustained me throughout the years. Um, uh, I will say, uh, honestly, I do not think I kept any of you out of trouble. I think I led you into it. Um, but hopefully I led you back out of it again. I, I see you nodding. Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, I, I mean, um, I am fundamentally uh, incredibly in debt. Uh, like Fred said, I mean, I think that uh, RSI was a foundational experience for me in terms of 
uh, academics and research <clears throat> and the career I've chosen. I want to thank uh, Joanne, who's been um, a friend, a mom, a, a mentor, a support uh, throughout these years. And I do think that one of the important things I do want to uh, ask everybody who's involved with this is that if um, RSI meant a lot to you that uh, you continue to support RSI because it is uh, totally funded out of uh, grants and support of the individuals, uh, like, and, and particularly the people who go there. So um, that being said, uh, I don't want to run too late. And so I'll get started on my talk and I'll go ahead and uh, start by sharing my screen. Um, and I will start. <clears throat> so uh, my topic is uh, tissue engineering for bone, cartilage, and soft tissue repair. Um, I'm currently the uh, Mark Neiman Family Chair at the North Shore Orthopedic and Spine Institute and have uh, appointments at uh, the University of Chicago in the Biomedical Engineering Department at Northwestern. Um, why do I think it's important that we talk about this kind of topic? Um, you know, uh, this is us at RSI. Uh, you can see us running around. Um, we're children. Uh, and then this is probably uh, us now, or at least uh, me now, because I'm one of the older classes. Um, and so what we know is that uh, bone and joint disorders account for more than a half of all chronic conditions in people over the age of 50 and are the most common cause of severe long-term pain and disability among uh, the American population. Um, interestingly, though, the NIH uh, funding for this is about uh, somewhere between 1% to 2% of the total NIH budget. So my interest has always been in tissue engineering for uh, close to 30 years at this point in time. Many musculoskeletal tissues have limited capacity for regeneration or healing. Our current techniques to regrow or rebuild tissue are limited. Uh, you can use autologous grafting, which is uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, you know, Fred is able to take arteries from one part of the body and put into the other, but there is morbidity associated with that. Um, allograft tissue, which is donated tissue from uh, people who have died, uh, has a risk of infection, rejection, lack of incorporation, and as Fred noted, you know, you don't have that many donor hearts floating around. Um, and that's true for musculoskeletal tissues as well. So um, one of the areas that we've been really interested in is using uh, citrate, uh, citric acid scaffolds. Um, my primary collaborator uh, in all this is uh, Yermo Amir. He, uh, he got his uh, DSI from uh, MIT, and uh, he developed basically a material that uses uh, citric acid um, and made it into an elastomeric biodegradable uh, scaffold. So, and it's also loaded with hydroxyapatite, which is the kind of calcium that you go, that puts into bone. So it's elastomeric, so it's kind of rubbery and bounces um, and flexible, and then it degrades over time. Many of you are familiar with the citric acid cycle, um, which is the primary way that we uh, use energy in the body. And, and so if you have citrate, this is actually just fits right into that and is very uh, biologically friendly. An area for me that's been a significant interest is cartilage injuries. Cartilage injuries are very common. About 63% of knee arthroscopies show this and they're a source of significant pain and morbidity. Uh, if you have knee pain, um, this is probably the cause in many patients. Uh, it does impair quality of life uh, equal to that of severe osteoarthritis and actually can uh, go on to severe arthritis. Um, and uh, Robert Hunter in the 18th century uh, said, ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome thing. Once destroyed, is not repaired. Um, cartilage, as you can see, is that white shiny stuff, except, um, and it's white and shiny because it has no blood supply and very limited ability to heal. So, uh, Guillermo and I uh, started looking at the, the scaffold material. Uh, it's a POC, it's a citrate, um, and we can engineer it to mimic the stiffness and mineral content of bone or cartilage by adding things like uh, nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite. It's elastomeric, so it uh, sort of has some flex in it, which is uh, unlike some of the rigid uh, other sur surfaces that we use, like ceramics that have been proposed as uh, scaffolds. And then the other component is that it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, citrate is pennies uh, and it's safe. Uh, we started originally uh, in the mid-2000s uh, mid uh, with uh, cell growth and adhesion. We could see that uh, if you see these cells with human cartilage cells, they actually grew and then formed a layer, as you can uh, 
see over on the right side. And so we actually decided to use this as a way to try to replace cartilage uh, in animal study. Uh, so we actually did uh, animal knees. You can see there's a, a New Zealand white rabbit there. Um, and uh, you can uh, see that. Um, and so we made small plugs and put them into the cartilage, uh, a defect in the end of the femoral condyle, the end of the knee joint. So the results is that uh, these patients uh, showed uh, stability of the implant, no adhesions or degenerative changes. There were a little bit of degeneration in the opposite tibial plateau. Basically, uh, you can see the area where there's a little irregularity in the cartilage, but most of the cartilage after a period of time seemed and looked pretty normal. You can barely tell the difference between that and normal cartilage in the knee. Uh, looking at it histologically, uh, there showed evidence of collagen growth, uh, specifically collagen type 2, which is important in articular cartilage, the joint lining cartilage. And you can see what happens after six weeks is that um, this was very friendly, the bone grew onto it, and then there was an actual layer of healing tissue on top of it as opposed, that looked fairly normal um, with the normal architecture of bone and cartilage, unlike what we saw in an unfilled defect, which just had this random network of cells. And so uh, what we've circled there is sort of this random islands of uh, cartilage within just sort of fibrous tissue. Again, looking at it at further time points, 26 weeks, half a year, um, the cartilage you can see in the uh, early on, and as it goes further and further, it starts looking more and more normal. And at 52 weeks, you know, most of the cartilage, uh, the plug had been degraded and replaced with normal cartilage. Our histology scores looked very good uh, in terms of uh, the ability. And so we were satisfied that this implant had excellent short and long-term biocompatibility, supported the growth of cells, and actually promoted normal joint function. Now, I am a sports medicine physician, and uh, you know I do take care of professional athletes. Um, one of the common things that we can see is anterior cruciate ligament injuries. Uh, these are fairly common. Over 300,000 of them are done in the United States with an annual cost of over a billion dollars. Uh, the way we rebuild this is either by whacking out a piece of bone and cartilage or meniscus from, or, or, or a hamstring tendon from the patient's own knee, or waiting for somebody to die and using allograft tissue. Our goal was to sort of see if we could tissue engineer the anterior cruciate ligament that used all regions, um, creating using biodegradable materials and uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And so we made a synthetic ACL graft uh, with a combined uh, POC, the citric acid scaffold at the ends, and uh, braided poly L lactic acid uh, fibers, which are high strength uh, fiber that degrades over time. Uh, we developed a technique to make the porous uh, uh, citric acid hydroxyapatite scaffolds. And so you can see that it's uh, actually using a foaming technique. Um, so it has all these interconnected pores which allow cells to grow in and rebuild the bone. The second region was this ligament scaffold, poly L lactic acid. Uh, lactic acid, um, it's the stuff that makes uh, milk sour and also builds up in your muscles. So it's very um, biologically friendly. Uh, it's FDA approved, it's biodegradable, uh, but you can see in the electron microscopy on the bottom right that you can actually get mesenchymal stem cells that grow fibroblasts, and then we actually have good strength when it's actually braided. So we actually made a composite graft with the braid and then coated the ends with this porous uh, citrate uh, scaffold that had hydroxyapatite, the calcium in it. Uh, and you can sort of see the fibers on the right side of the screen and the porous uh, foamed uh, scaffold, uh, sort of incorporating, wrapping around those fibers. Uh, you can see the little specks of the nanocomposite uh, hydroxyapatite crystals. And we did ACL surgery in rabbits. Uh, these are really tiny. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, uh, almost as small as the eye. Anthony was talking about the two millimeter incisions. We made three millimeter tunnels in the knee um, and uh, fixed this graft inside the knee of these animals and then uh, over time uh, sacrifice the animals at different time points to see what happened. Um, and what we could see is that over time, and this is a histology of this, that the material would be incorporated and the bone and tissue would grow into it. The central portion actually had good fibrous tissue recreating a normal ligament. Uh, we actually did animal functional scores. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, testing the 440, uh, you know, seeing if you can get a 
40 yard, 50 yard dash in a rabbit, but we did test how much they moved and how they were moving. And they were actually worked pretty well. So we found that there was good integration of this graft to bone and formation of the ligament. The mechanical properties were maintained. And we thought it was a promising strategy to regenerate appropriate tissues for ACL tissue engineering. And we're continuing to work on ligament regeneration and also use of this porous uh, uh, scaffold as a potential drug delivery device or for other uses. Um, it did receive some press. Uh, it's not quite as cool as like the cover of Sports Illustrated, but uh, we were on the cover of Tissue Engineering Part C, uh, and I'm sure all of you have a copy of this at home, uh, or the Journal of Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine. So on the left side, it shows how the porous scaffold integrated, the bone is growing into the porous scaffold, and on the uh, right side is a, a picture of our braided uh, ligament graft. Now, obviously, um, we're very interested in what the scientific media said. And so uh, the other scientific media that we got a lot of press from was such great uh, scientific outlets such as Fox News, ESPN, Futurism, and, and Gadget. Um, I, I love how the uh, ESPN article is, the crazy technology that could change NBA players in the future. Um, uh, obviously, this is a professional highlight of my career. Uh, not really, but um, it, is, it was kind of fun to sort of see how uh, science can move into the clinical or uh, public realm. I guess the other thing is that uh, this technology uh, has been licensed by a company called Acuitive Technologies. Uh, you can see their little logo in the bottom right where it has uh, a lemon and a little pile of uh, citric acid. Um, and actually we're in the way to getting uh, FDA 510 uh, FDA approval for using uh, this scaffold material to help the patients uh, clinically um, and hopefully that's coming in the next uh, few months or so. So um, that's been exciting to sort of be a part of a project that went really from an idea uh, to uh, in the lab, in cell culture, to animal studies, and now uh, hopefully soon to human application. Um, this is our orthopedic specialty hospital. It's a dedicated facility, the only one in the Chicago region that's dedicated to orthopedic and spine. Uh, I do run a relatively large department, which has 35 employed uh, orthopedic surgeons and about 50 affiliated uh, orthopedic surgeons. Um, and uh, you're always welcome to visit us in Chicago. My email is above, uh, drjasonco at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me if you have questions about healthcare or medicine um, or science or um, I guess uh, any other way I could help. Um, but again, I am so appreciative to uh, Joanne, to RSI, to CEE, um, because uh, without this, I would not have been inspired to go along this career. Um, it's been incredibly fulfilling for me, um, and I do think it is important for all of us to give back uh, as much as we've received uh, from uh, CEE. Thanks. Jason, thank you. That was fantastic. I want to thank all of our panelists for some really inspiring talks today. By the way, those last two, I also wanted to point out one other thing. If you get a chance, make sure that you always quote articles that have your name on them because it really shows your expertise. Every slide Amy had up was a paper she had written, and that is just unbelievable to me. So, you know, congratulations to everybody's success. I think hopefully the theme you've heard today is that RSI for all of us was an experience that was transformative in our careers and our young lives. We were teenagers when we all met, and this really transformed our careers. So I wanna open it up to a group discussion. And I was looking first at kind of the list of all the participants in this call today, and I noticed there are some folks who are uh, RSI alumni, there are some younger RSI alum, um, many would say that anybody younger than us is a younger RSI alum at this point. Uh, there are some educators on this call. And all of you have had tremendous careers, not only in STEM, but also as clinicians taking care of sick people, which is kind of what our primary directive is. What do you tell younger folks who are brilliant scientists who are thinking about having a career that also involves clinical medicine? What do you tell people about the state of healthcare, about becoming a physician today, about the training and about your career? Can we just talk about that for a bit? I'll start, I guess. Um, uh, I think for me, one of the things that has really helped me is having good collaborators. I think, um, uh, you know, the idea of like a lone scientist working by themselves and making all these amazing discoveries is really, uh, 
you know, I think it's uh, very archaic. And so if I didn't have great collaborators that could, I could work with, um, uh, none of this would have happened. Um, and, I, you know, I think, um, you know, Amy was calling out her, uh, the people in her lab. And uh, I know that without Guillermo, who made these kind of things, you know, I can certainly provide some clinical expertise and input. But I think with these kind of partnerships between um, clinicians and research, basic science researchers is where uh, there's a huge amount of opportunity. I think one of the nice things about being a physician is that you never have to question the value of your work. I think even if you're a pure scientist, you know, what percentage of pure science ever goes to actually helping people? 2%, 1%. So most scientists, actually their life's work doesn't transform human life, if we actually think about it. And so physicians never really have to go home knowing the value of their work. And so that I think is, you know, it's enormously satisfying to give a father, brother, sister, mother, you know, to restore them to quality of life and give them more time to spend with their family or doing the things that they enjoy. There's nothing more important or rewarding than that. You know, I'll follow up on what Fred said. You know, I, I do a lot of teaching. I do very little academic research. Uh, I'm a clinician and I do a lot of teaching and I tell everybody I come in contact with to follow your passions. Pay attention to what gets you going, what gets you excited and follow those passions. Uh, the rewards of, you know, a financial security or a particular job that you want will come easily if you follow your passions. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. It, it takes, um, you know, uh, we all, probably work very hard um, and it and it's a long training period and then even once you're attending you think oh it's going to get so much better and you do have some control over your time but you're still working pretty hard so it's important to really think about what you're doing and pick what you what really inspires you because if you pick a field because it's what you're supposed to do then it just becomes that much harder so so it's important to have people around you who you like and who you trust and who can support you and and to really pick something that you that fits you not what you think you're supposed to do which is a is a hard thing sometimes to figure out but you really do have to go in with an open mind like when you do your rotations or when you're in classes because if you think i'm going to be a pediatrician and you hate your pediatrics rotations then it's, it's not a good thing, right? You're not going to be a pediatrician or you shouldn't be at least. So, so I think that's, it's really important to keep an open mind and, and to have people who, who are there to support you and, and to really pick what you like to do. That's awesome. Um, you know, I would love to hear from you guys because we've talked a lot about uh, sort of state of the art medicine and things that are really driving medicine forward. What's the next great thing in medical care? What is it that 10 years from now people are going to say revolutionized medicine, either in your individual field or in general? What's on the horizon for us for, for healthcare? Well, I, I think on a panel where there's so many surgeons, I, I think that the thing that's going to revolutionize is that the medical treatments are so much better, we, there will be less for us to do. I mean, I mean, there are already cancers where people got amputations 30 years ago that we don't even touch anymore so so i think in in our field at least really surgery is going to go it's going to slowly go away or change at least. i think that's true i think that you know the open surgery of the aorta will probably all go away you know where you have to cut the patient literally in half to be changed by endovascular minimally invasive approaches i think that trend will certainly continue for sure you know in my field i think it's going to be um, i think it's going to be gene therapy the nanoparticles uh you know the eye is a contained organ a small organ it's very um, there's a certain uh, attraction to using these sorts of uh, therapies in the eye and i think that's where it's going to go yeah i think things are clearly getting more minimally invasive um uh, i do think that you know at least uh Body parts wear out, and I do think that the idea that you could replace them or, or regrow them uh, 
is uh, very attractive in almost all fields. I mean, so some of so Shahom, some of the areas where we've been working on is like um, using the scaffold to regenerate the mandible, for example, or uh, you know, vascular tissue. Uh, so I think that um, as the understanding of biology and material science continues to grow, there's still going to be a need for um, you know replacement of the tissue that's there. Um, clearly. Uh, medical management um, and you know evidence-based medicine you know pushes a lot of things towards you know non-surgical care in many cases but um, there's always going to be people who uh, hurt things break things wear things out so uh, uh, there's still going to be a great need um, as long as uh, our bodies keep aging <laughs> Great. Um, you know, we're getting a couple questions from the panel. One, one question is about genetic treatments, and I think that's an important one for us to talk about. And the other one I, I really want to get to here is somebody asked, I noticed that many of you are surgeons. At what point in your life did you realize that you all wanted to practice medicine, especially surgery? And I want to actually field that question first because my story may be a little bit atypical. I went into medical school because my undergrad degree at Stanford was in medical artificial intelligence. I was a computer scientist and I was interested in artificial intelligence design. I only went to medical school because my advisor said if I didn't have an MD, nobody would take me seriously. I developed a passion for actually taking care of sick people during medical school. That's when I actually developed an interest in taking care of sick people. But I didn't decide until my last week of my third year of medical school to become a surgeon. I was very late to the game. And despite that, I've managed to, to enjoy some career success. So for those of you younger folks who are still in your educational phase, don't feel like you have to have your career path directly set for you now. It changes every step of the way. I thought right up until I was about 19 years old, I was going to be a fashion designer. And it wasn't until my last week of uh, my third year of medical school, starting my senior year, that I realized I wanted to be a surgeon. It changes, and don't get locked into one sort of tunnel vision. That's my take on it. But I'd love to hear the panel's, uh, the panel's assessment on that. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of drifted there. Um, you know, I was uh, taken by engineering and studied uh, electrical engineering at MIT and um, thought I would uh, model uh, the nervous system and, and neurologic problems with uh, electrical engineering. And just about that time, two, three decades ago, molecular biology was coming into its own and, and I was following my passions and driven by that and decided, you know, I'm gonna go to medical school and I'm gonna bring together neuroscience with uh, molecular neurobiology and neurology and make this all happen. And I was well on my way to doing that and got a PhD in molecular neurobiology. And then um, I got into clinical neurology and I hated it. It was just awful. It was, um, and I, I mean this in the most sincere way, I just didn't, it didn't resonate with me. The, the, the strokes that I saw it was just a very depressing um, situation and it really couldn't be fixed in any way. And, and I scrambled, this was in my probably late third year, beginning of fourth year medical school. And the next um, rotation I did was ophthalmology. And it was these uh, two surgeons. Uh, they were great guys. Uh, they were family guys. And they just served as role models for me. I, they were, enjoyed what they were doing. I got into the operating room, room with them. The lights went down. The lasers came on. They turned Weezer on the radio. And all was right with the world, right? I could, I just, it just hit with me. So you know, it was a, um, I came home that evening. I told my wife I was going to become an ophthalmologist. And and it was all history after that. I think it's a role model. And I think it's seeing someone that you respect, seeing someone that you can emulate, seeing someone that's done something that makes them happy that uh, you could be happy doing. Uh, Amy, I'd love to hear your take on this as well and also about the genetic treatments because that's a, a big part of your research. Yeah, I mean, I was never going to be a surgeon. I was, so I was always going to be a researcher, and it wasn't until I started, um, about after my junior year of college, I was in a lab at UNC, and my advisor, it was about the time the MSTS programs for MD-PhDs were starting 
to really gain some steam and he he sort of encouraged me to look into that and so I had applied um, and had gotten into some MSTS programs and um, so so that that sort of got waylaid a little bit because with the Marshall Scholarship I couldn't do do those programs and so I did my PhD uh, as when I went abroad and then Harvard deferred so I came back and did my MD there and and again with the research I had done my research in salmonella so it's the only worse dinner party conversation than surgery but it it was also completely opposite right and so I was going to be an infectious disease and I was going to and then I didn't like medicine and I did my surgery rotation and I loved it, whether I was cutting abscesses or doing pancreatic surgery. And even after that though, I was like, that's ridiculous. I was like, I'll, I'll switch a little, I'll do oncology. I set up my fourth year rotations and did a surgery sub I to convince myself that I just didn't want to do it. And, and again, just had good mentors and, um, and loved it. Uh, and I was on this team and there were all these guys and uh, it was like, there was nobody I could look to, to say, okay, that person looks like me and associate. It was a little different than, than maybe Anthony's experience, but, but still they were good. Um, they were very uh, supportive of me and encouraged me. And so, so it went from there. And, um, and then the research I figured I'd have to lay off of, but then when I did my fellowship in oncology, it, it provided an opportunity to go back to that. So, so it, the pieces sort of came slowly and it was really just being open-minded and sort of recognizing when I had to change because um, when I had to change my plan because something else was, was better for me and, and accepting that and not sort of sticking with what I was supposed to do, but, but it was a little bit windy and I probably decided even later than you did to go into surgery. If I was, well, if it was October of my fourth year, that was pretty, that was the last minute. <laughs> so a follow up question, and I'm gonna have Fred start with this one because Kathy asked a really good question. We've got five surgeons on the panel. Is that coincidence or what have you? But Kathy asked the question, what if surgery is not an option? Now, I don't know if the question is meant in terms of treatment paradigms or what if surgery isn't an option as a career? You know, then what happens? You know, the, the beauty of medicine is that there's a specialty for somebody, for anybody. You know, uh, the type A personality gravitates towards surgery, but not everybody's a type A personality. There is a specialty that fits the personality and desires and personal fit for anybody. Dermatology, radiation oncology, medicine, subspecializes in pulmonary, critical care, you can take care of extremely sick patients and have that satisfaction without having, you know, let's say the stress of the operating room and critical care. And so there really are multiple specialties that one can find to fit any particular personality. So just for the audience, just because we have so many surgeons, don't let that dissuade you from medicine. There is a specialty for you. The other thing I would add to that, Fred, is, you know, there's this reputation, and I think we all hear it in medical school. You know, when you're an early medical student, they warn you the surgeons are mean, they're really unhappy, they're very intense, they work all the time. The reason I do head and neck surgery is because when I was a med student in the otolaryngology, that's how you pronounce it, uh, department, all the surgeons were super happy, and they really loved their lives. And the same thing with the ophthalmologists. And you know, I found that there were certain types of individuals that I just sort of gravitated towards. And even though, you know, I may not be the prototypical surgeon's personality, I found a group of people that I really fit in with. And I think, you know, you brought up the point that there's something out there for everybody in this career field. And I'd love to hear your guys' take on this. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, you know, there are definitely lots of different options and each one has different pros and cons. I mean, you rotate through, you know, there are usually four core rotations, right? Internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, and then OBGYN. And, and every, and you meet different people and you talk to them about what their lives are like and you, you study the different diseases. And, and in the end, a lot of it comes down to that. It, it, we're each sort of taking, each specialty takes care of different kinds of diseases that may or may not interest you more. And each specialty has a little bit different 
lifestyle and a, a but even once you pick your specialty, you know, different institutions have different different personalities. So it's there's always an option and a place for you to fit in, and uh, and it's just about taking a look around and seeing what those options really are. You know, they're they're nice surgeons and they're mean surgeons. They're nice medical doctors. They're very mean medical doctors. They're nice people, and so you know these stereotypes. You know, I don't. Um, I don't necessarily think they're all true. And oftentimes you can have surgeons of one specialty at one hospital be very nice, but then the very same specialty in the hospital down the street, they're very mean. Yeah. And so it's very kind of interesting how each culture of each individual hospital can, can work. And it's important too to talk to the people in the specialty you're interested about. Everybody who was outside of surgery told me, oh, Amy, you can never be a surgeon, right? You, you just don't have that personality. You don't fit in. And then I went to talk to my mentor on surgery, and he was like, oh, no, this is great. You know, he's like, let's write your letter. We'll figure it all out. So, so I think it's important. You know, there are lots of surgeons who had people tell them, no, you can't be a surgeon because there are these, these stereotypes. But, um, well, maybe that's how we break those stereotypes is we stop, you know, only trying to find people who fit the stereotype and instead find brilliant minds who will change the stereotype. And I think that's exactly, you know, what's happening when you look at this diverse group of people. Yeah, I mean, Shahom, one of the things I, I do wanna say is that medicine is a really, um, first of all, I do think that you have to have a passion if you wanna be a doctor because it does take a long time. The training is arduous. Um, but it, I do find it very personally rewarding to say, okay, I did something to help other people. Um, that that's fundamentally really important to me. And um, so that part of the job I really like, but uh, I think all of us have seen, even in our professional careers, how things have evolved. And, uh, you know, Fred runs a cardiac surgery department and, you know, there's a lot of different responsibilities there. Anthony is uh, in a busy, really busy private practice. And I'm sure he's learned how to run a business pretty well as a result. And I, I think these, um, your career will continue to grow and develop. Um, if you're a physician, uh, one of the exciting things is, as you know, some of the questions are coming up, uh, things continue to change and evolve. Um, whatever you're doing, whether you're uh, doing research or practicing, it's going to continue to grow and learn and things are going to change and you're going to be able to have that kind of intellectual stimulation uh, throughout your career. <clears throat> and then the other thing is like if you wanted to you can go into different aspects like public health or management or uh, you know I've had some friends go ahead and do um, or work for a hedge fund just do startup companies etc. So there's uh, medicine is an incredibly flexible career but I think it does come down to the core of like helping other people. Um, you can certainly do that in many ways. Uh, being a surgeon, um, although I love being a surgeon, uh, you know, uh, isn't, you know, there's a lot of ways in which you can uh, contribute to your patient's well-being. Um, and uh, I look forward to watching uh, the next one of these panels where there's a bunch of non-surgeons involved, uh, because I think uh, in many ways, uh, they're smarter than we are, so. <laughs> Um, a great question came up, and I'd love to hear everybody's answer on this. Uh, what diseases are untreatable now that you think will be treatable in the next few years? I'm going to put my vote in and say this, COVID. Yes, I went 90 minutes without saying the word COVID on a medical panel until now. What do you guys think? You know, from what my infectious disease friends tell me, the virus is one that eminently should be susceptible to a vaccine. doesn't necessarily mutate that much is what my ID specialty friends tell me. So I agree, COVID should be treatable, hopefully soon. I was just reading the paper, and I think Pfizer got some billion-dollar grant yeah. to uh, put some forth some vaccine. So hopefully all of this, you know, pain can be behind us very soon. Anthony, what do you think? You know, I think about my own field, and uh, then I – and what comes to mind – is macular degeneration. Uh, macular degeneration is a problem essentially of angiogenesis, um, a growth of new blood vessels, growth of new blood vessels where they aren't supposed to be and where they aren't normal. And um, 
we have some stopgap measures now, anti-angiogenesis factors that we inject inside the eye. But there's a signal. There's something that's turning these growth factors on. And, and this is a disorder that affects uh, millions uh, in the United States, millions worldwide. The population is aging. The problem is just getting worse and worse. It's unrelenting. And I think, um, I think that's where it'll be. Uh, I think uh, outside of my field, Alzheimer's. Uh, I think Alzheimer's is, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of money after it. There's um, some definite pathways I'm reading. Um, uh, for treatments, and I think we'll see that. I think we'll see uh, lots of progress uh, in our lifetimes on Alzheimer's. Jason? Um, what do I think that we're going to be able to treat? I mean, there's things I'd like to be able to treat, like osteoarthritis, which uh, we, I don't think we have a great solution for, and, uh, you know, I've been trying to regrow cartilage for close to 30 years and we were still pretty far from it. Uh, you know, I do think that we are making progress with uh, dementia. I think one of the things that I continue to be amazed about is how much progress we've made in cancer. And uh, Amy's all living that right now. Um, but, uh, you know, the use of genetic therapies um, and, uh, a gene modulation in order to treat cancer and other diseases is phenomenal and revolutionary. And, you know, um, you know, frankly, a lot of this is coming from, uh, you know, some of this is coming from CRISPR, which is, uh, you know, you know, one of the founders, uh, one of the people who have really investigated CRISPR and developed this is, is an RSI grad. So, um, and so, uh, you know, I'm sure Joanne's really proud of that. I, I, just think it's really amazing that we have these kind of technologies that continue to make advances. Whatever accomplishments I feel like I've been able to achieve, I mean, you know, there's some people, uh, and I know this is really one of the best things about RSI is fundamentally there's going to there's people who are around you in that group that are going to transform life for everybody. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, I feel very privileged to sort of have been part of a group, and you know, whatever I can contribute is great, but. Um, it's really neat to uh, know people like that as well. Amy, I'd love for you to have the last word on this because you have some real insight. Yeah, no, I mean, cancer is, the cancer changes week to week. And every time, you know, the big cancer meeting, ASCO in April, every year there's a new disease that we really turn into a chronic problem as opposed to as opposed to a death sentence. And, you know, for most of my patients now, I can say this is, it's a chronic disease that we're gonna manage for years, if not decades. And, and so, and more and more of them, I can say that to every year. So it really is changing month to year to year, if not month to month or week to week in, in most cases. And CRISPR will just uh, make those changes happen faster because we won't rely on drugs as much. Awesome. And, you know, to our audience who's still with us, I apologize that we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, some of them were kind of specific for individuals. So what I would say is if you want to get some detailed response, Mrs. D and Rich Rumsey at uh, CEE have all of our email addresses. We are all happy to correspond with uh, anybody who has individual questions, wants to talk about anything, about careers in healthcare, about future of science, about anything. I'm going to use this as a wrap-up opportunity. And I want to wrap up by saying this. I hope that everybody who's participated in this, uh, in this meeting has enjoyed this. I will tell you that I know that we have. Um, you know, for me, these are people that I grew up with. And these guys are some of the most important people in my world. And in the top left corner of my screen is Mrs. D, who I'm still in so many ways terrified of, but I love so much and has treated us like her own family for the last 35 or 40 years. So for me personally, this has been a huge thing to be a part of this. So thank you, bless you, Mrs. D. I will turn it over to you for closing comments and thank you to all the panelists for being a part of this. At home, I can almost cry, but I'm thinking, you know, I wish we would have had more time that you could have given us comments about one of your specialties, operating room fires. Yeah, it's super depressing. <laughs> so fascinating, the data you had. Um, maybe two minutes, three minutes before I wrap it up, can you 
Am I asking too much? Uh, if, if people want to, to hear about operating room fires in two minutes, I am happy to, to give you two minutes on the subject. Please. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen and then scroll down to, uh, to uh, show you. Let's see. I have not actually had to share my own screen yet. Share screen. Let's see. Here we go. And can you see my slide now? My slides? No. No? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to skip down to just show you a couple of things real quick. Fires in the operating room are frighteningly common. And in fact, it happens somewhere between 200 and 600 times a year. And so for all of us as surgeons, operating room fires are incredibly scary. And the reason I got into this subject is because I actually had, um, I actually had a near miss in the operating room about 10 years ago. I had a child who was on the operating table and I smelled smoke and I looked down and a light cable had burned a hole in the drape. And you can see that drape hole here from the light cable. And the patient would have been severely injured except I'd already moved the kid onto a stretcher and rolled out of the room. And folks, for those of you who are wondering how we end up in these kinds of uh, areas of research, a lot of it is just fortuitous. There's an old expression that says that good judgment comes from experience. Unfortunately, most of that experience comes from bad judgment. And, uh, you know, for me, this eye-opening experience where I thought I was going to be a clinical pediatric airway surgeon opened my eyes to these risks in the operating room of safety, which has led to my scientific career in operating room safety. So my lab set out to start studying operating room fires, and we found out that it happened somewhere between 200 and 600 times a year, but amazingly, you don't really have to report it to anybody because up until recently, we didn't have a central reporting database. And fun fact, the other thing is it's a huge liability concern. So this was a case in central Washington. I become kind of the world's expert on this, so I review all these cases through the FDA, the Joint Commission, and I get asked to do a lot of legal uh, negotiations. Mrs. D knows I've never been married. One of the reasons is I am a terrible negotiator. Here's what happened when I tried to negotiate this case in central Washington. An ENT surgeon like me was doing laser airway surgery. A woman's uh, endotracheal tube ignited on fire and she was burned horribly. She ended up dying three years later. And after I tried to negotiate it, the final settlement was $30 million. It bankrupt the hospital system. Fires are a basic physical concept, oxygen, fuels, and ignition. And we put them in the same place they light on fire. So I'm gonna skip all this stuff except to show you um, just a couple of videos because the videos are far more interesting. Um, this is what happens when somebody gets lit on fire. Can you see the video? Yes. Okay, so this is me doing laser airway surgery like I do as a head and neck surgeon. And if I accidentally hit the endotracheal tube, watch the smoke coming out of my mannequin model. And I'm going to call fire, 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 and turn off the oxygen, and then pull the tube out. This is what actually happens in real people. But when you look at it from the inside view, this is what happens. So I'm doing laser laryngeal surgery here. I'm trying to take a tumor off of a plastic mannequin. But I misfire and hit the tube, and the tube gets lit on fire. So I'm going to pull the fire out. But when you do the endoscopy, you can see that there's a horrible burn injury to the airway. And this happens all the time, folks. We see you know, hundreds of cases a year of burns to the skin, burns to the airway, things like that. Particularly in head and neck surgery, we're at very high risk because all those elements of fire, an ignition source, oxygen, and a flammable material is in very close proximity. So this is where uh, I have turned this into a career of trying to keep people out of trouble. I've developed some products and things which I'll not talk about now. I'm gonna just leave you with one last slide. This is from my lab where we were doing a review of what happens when you don't realize. So this is a, basically a mannequin model setup of an operating room fire. So I'm using a laser protected endotracheal tube. I'm gonna misfire the laser and I'm gonna recognize there's a fire. So I'm gonna yell out fire, fire, fire. I, I'm prepared for this. So I have water and I'm gonna pour it down the airway and I think I'm in the clear. So I'm like, great, I prevented this from something terrible happening. But watch what's happening down here in the distance that I can't see. These lung fields with their plastic bags are filled with oxygen. And that's the fire extinguisher, which kept us from blowing up the operating room. So, you know, fire 
the dawn of man, civilization is based around fire, but fire is a terrible thing when it happens in the operating room. So uh, that's just kind of my quick take on operating room fires. Again, quality and safety are a huge element of medical care these days. The government payers, their primary directive now is not just to keep providing care, but to provide quality care. And a huge element of quality in medical delivery is safety. So we've got to learn not just how to provide care to people, but how to provide good care that's efficient, that's equitable, that's, that's well done, that has good outcomes, and that most of all keeps patients safe above everything else. So you can have careers in uh, other arenas other than just basic sciences that also involves uh, quality care delivery. So that's my two minute take on uh, operating room fires. I hope that was just a couple minutes. I could talk about this stuff for hours. And I, actually do. I, I think it was a wonderful uh, finish. It was a little different, but it is something that people don't give enough thought to. Maybe we shouldn't because it's so scary to think about. But I want to thank all the RSI alumni panelists, Amy, um, Fred, Jason, Anthony, and Shahom, a terrific job. Thank you so very much. To our guests, today you've learned about the product of the center's many years of educational STEM program. The center nurtures scientific and technological talent like the panelists you heard from today, like Terry Tal, Tal the old medalist in math, Ben Silverman, founder of Pinterest, and Feng Zhang, developer of CRISPR. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it's friends, individuals, corporations, and organizations that make the center's efforts possible at no cost to any of the students accepted to the programs. Please review programs and activities at www.cee.org. You're invited to partner with the center in your philanthropy, particularly needed and appreciated at this challenging time. You're also invited to register for upcoming webinars as they are scheduled. I can't promise that they'll be as outstanding as the one we had today, but we'll do our darndest to try. I trust you found this session informative, helpful, and a good use of your time. Be safe, be well. Thank you very much. <laughs>